This is Duke University. Welcome to the afternoon session of this conference in honor of Barbara Bernstein Smith. My name is Jane Tompkins. I was a member of the Duke English Department for many years and a friend and colleague of Barbara's. And it's a great honor to have been included uh, in these proceedings. Um, it, I, I'm so pleased to be part of this. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover this afternoon, so I'm not going to spend too much time on preliminaries. But I wanted to say that the other day, I was going through a pile of papers, and I came across um, a piece of paper that had on it a final paragraph of an essay by Barbara called New Naturalists. I haven't been reading academic work for like 12 or 15 years. It must have fallen off the bottom of a chapter that Stanley had and gotten into my papers by mistake. And so I read this final paragraph, and I it knocked me over. It was like, I felt the way I felt when I first read Contingencies of Value and appeared for the first time in Critical Inquiry. And it was like watching an athlete at the top of his form hitting one home run, home run after another into the stand over and over and over. In this one paragraph, she takes apart any assumptions you might have been carrying on about, carrying with you about religion. Uh, she all does the same for science. Uh, she takes away your notion of the explanatory power or the extent of, of science's power to explain things. And then, when the dust has cleared, there's this sort of field of possibilities and, and the possible emergence of many new strange shapes and forms. And at the end of the paragraph, she sort of she, she exits with a sort of characteristic Barbara lick of her tail. It is, it is so stunning. I, I, I don't have the book with me or the page, but go back and I don't, this is from her, I assume from your new book, Natural Reflections. It is so stunning. The new naturalist's last paragraph. Marvelous. Um, we have three wonderful speakers this afternoon. Um, what we'll do is each speaker will talk and then we'll have questions at the end. Um, the first speaker is Andrew Janiak, who is a professor of philosophy here at Duke, um, where he, uh, he is a historian of the philosophy of science. Uh, he has been a fellow at the Dibner Institute for the History of Science and Technology at MIT and is now a member of the Franklin Humanities Institute. He's been at Duke since 2002, and in the year 2000. Nine, eight, nine, he won the Richard Loveland Distinguished Teaching Award. Congratulations. Um, his, his major work is Newton as Philosopher, published by Cambridge in 2008. And he has edited Isaac Newton Philosophical Writings for Cambridge University Press. Uh, he has many, many articles on the work of Isaac Newton and Immanuel Kant. And is currently at work on um, two projects of great interest. One is a volume in the Oxford Philosophical Concepts series called Space, which he told me a few minutes ago, will take the concept of space through history at various discrete moments of time, each moment being treated by a different uh, contributor. And then between each of these essays, there will appear a sort of interstitial piece that will come at the concept of space from a different discipline, such as geology. It sounds like a wonderful, exciting enterprise. And um, the second uh, of his current projects um, is an examination of the idea of revolution in the history of science, uh, asking the question, why is it that philosophers cling to the notion of revolution as somehow integral to an understanding of how science develops? And that seems to be also a very, uh, a very fascinating topic. Um, today, he is going to speak to us. Um, <clears throat> I've lost my page. Um, this topic this afternoon is. <laughs> Here we go. What was nature? Revisiting the nexus of science and religion. Andrew. Well, I didn't know I was coming up first. <laughs> uh, 
was preparing to write my talk while you two were presenting, but it doesn't matter. Okay, well, uh, we've had so many technological problems with laptops and iPads and iPods and iTouches and these sorts of things that I made a handout. <laughs> because handouts never fail. That's more. There are more. I hope there are enough. I also have one more extremely important technological prop. An apple. Uh, you'll see why apples are important there. Whoa, I'm not used to a microphone. I must use it though, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is a, a huge honor for me uh, because Barbara and I co taught last year. It's one of the great highlights of my, albeit short career, but I'm <coughs> sure, no matter how long my career may be, it'll remain one of the great highlights of my career. I learned a huge amount from teaching with her and from our regular lunches that followed various sessions in the classroom. So I hope she has an idea of why I'm about to say what I'm going to say. Uh, forgive me if no one else has any idea why I'm saying it, but I'm sure it will connect the themes from our course at least. Okay, um, I'm mostly going to talk, as you can tell from the, the subtitle, about Harper's latest work, The Terry Lectures and Natural Reflections. So if you haven't read that, there are, I think, a few quotations on your handout. Actually, I think I need a handout. Someone can give me one. Oh, Chrissy, Chrissy, Chrissy. Just to make sure. Thank you. Okay. I'm not going to read all of these, but some you'll see how they fit in. Let me begin with a caveat, which philosophers usually do. I want to discuss what Barbara calls the nexus of science and religion by adopting an oblique angle on the discussion. Because the debates about how the picture of the world found in the natural sciences relates to, undermines, or connects with the picture of the world found in various religious traditions, those debates are so vociferous, overheated, and chaotic that you cannot hope to get really anywhere by simply jumping into it. Instead, I turn to a theme of Barbara's Terry Lectures, Natural Reflections, for some guidance. So let me begin with the first passage on your handout. This emerges, this familiar Shakespearean theme emerges in the, toward the end of Terry, the Terry Lectures. Here's what she writes. Most of us, I think, including most scientists, would agree that, as Hamlet puts it, there are more things in heaven and earth than dreamt of in our philosophies. Or, as we may gloss the much-cited passage for our present purposes, there are more types of entities and forces in our individual experiences of the universe than set forth in current scientific models of the shared phenomenal I don't believe that this is the last word on the question, but I do believe it is the first word. I also believe that Barbara is on to something absolutely central in her uh, text, Natural Reflections, when she distinguishes between methodological and metaphysical naturalism. Metaphysical naturalism, she tells us, represents the idea that we can take the sum total of scientific knowledge and have it answer the question, what are all the things that are? Of course, as Barbara also notes, we then find various naturalists making the following move. They say, now that science has given us a complete catalog of the universe, whatever is not in that catalog, like, say, the mind, or the soul, or God, must not exist. I happen to think that, that kind of move is fallacious. And it can perhaps be shown to be fallacious most easily if we avoid speaking for the moment about things such as God or the soul, which are rather controversial, and focus on things which are less controversial. I'll then return to the nexus of science and religion toward the end of my talk. I do hope that I'll stay within time, but if I don't, I'll simply speak faster. <laughs> <laughs> Philosophers have often tackled the issue of what we call settling our ontology by presenting it through a particular lens. Philosophers dis discuss what they call the relation between the most fundamental science of physics and the so-called special sciences, which would include things like biology, maybe chemistry, certainly medicine, psychology, and so on. Although many philosophers in the early 20th century were rather enamored of the idea that the entities and causal explanations of any of the special sciences would ultimately be reduced to the entities and causal explanations of the most fundamental science, physics, that kind of reductionism is now much in dispute. <laughs> 
A recent presidential address to the Philosophy of Science Association, for example, by Larry Sklar, makes this point very clear. And I actually have a quote from Sklar, which I'll read in a moment. So let me, um, let me try to, uh, well, let me just read that so, that, so you know what, exactly where we are. And I, I, I will skip some, not this one. Here's what Sklar says, this was only two years ago in the Philosophy of Science Association. Now, science consists of lots of different kinds of theories. Some of them are fundamental, and some derivative, phenomenological, or special. And we are now all sensitive to the fact that simple-minded accounts of the ultimate reducibility of all the non-foundational theories to the foundational are dubious. I chose this quote because that's one of our materials, too. It appeared earlier today. Of course, you might say simple-minded accounts are always do. But anyway, so in any that was a joke. <laughs> so in any account of our naturalistic ontology, we will need some deft handling of the problem of how to fit the ontology of the special, limited, and non-foundational sciences into the world to which we are directed by the foundational theories like physics. This is the reason I really like this quote. Where exactly do apples, our first appearance of my friend, and stock options belong in a world of relativistic quantum fields. Where indeed? I will explore that in a moment. For his part, Sklar, the president of the Philosophy Science Association, passes over the profound implications of this last sentence by quickly assuring us that we really needn't worry about such things as that. He says, quote, we should take as the entities and properties of the universe those entities and properties are most general and most foundational theories tell us there are. <laughs> now, there's a twist. To his credit, Sklar does not think that that really tells you what you think it tells you. It doesn't settle much about our ontology, because according to Sklar, and I want to explore this for a moment, I think Barbara might be interested in this too, according to Sklar, even if you were to accept what he just said, the most fundamental theories are the ones that matter, that settles little because there are different interpretations of the most fundamental theories. That's what Sklar's address is really about. He gives many examples of this from the history of science, but I, of course, would like to give one from Isaac Newton. So as you probably know, Newton first published what we would consider the first text in modern mathematical physics in 1687. He called it Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. This dominated discussions within physics, it's fair to say, by the second half of the 18th century and well into the 19th. Newton himself proclaimed, as you likely know, that in order to, stand to, in order to understand the true motions of objects in the world and the forces that cause them, we have to regard space as mathematical or absolute. Hence, the supposedly arch British empiricist posited an infinite three-dimensional Euclidean magnitude, absolute space, and told us that it exists independently of anything else in the universe. Many of Newton's readers and interpreters were quite upset with this notion. Even Newton himself knew that if you posit absolute space, along with some other things I'll go into, you end up with the idea that each body of the universe has a true velocity even though we can't measure them. All we can measure are accelerations. We can talk about that later. So Newton knew that the notion of absolute space was controversial and actually slightly stronger than anything that could be empirically measured, but he postulated nonetheless. But here's the rub for our purposes. By the end of the 18th century, or certainly into the early 19th century, many scientists knew that you could be a good Newtonian and accept laws of motion, the law of universal gravitation, without endorsing the idea of absolute space. So, this was one of the leading uh, theories in physics for several centuries. Did it tell us that there is an infinite three-dimensional Euclidean magnitude that you have to accept, or not? The theory did not settle this question. This sort of thing recurs throughout the history of science where even if you think physics somehow is the most fundamental theory that we should all be focused on, which philosophers often have, there are different interpretations of physics. And as a result, you can't escape hermeneutic questions, I dare say. 
Okay, that's where Larry Sparrow leaves us at the end of his presidential address. But I want to return to his little aside about apples and stock options. Recall he says, where exactly do apples and stock options belong in a world of quantum physics? I think we could just as easily ask, where do quantum fields belong in a world of stock options? By asking that question, I am deliberately invoking what I will call Barbara's principle of symmetry. If it is coherent, here's the principle. If it is coherent, fair, legitimate, etc., to assert that apples and stock options must somehow fit into the world of physics, then we must be symmetric in our thinking, concluding that it is coherent, fair, or legitimate to assert that the quantum fields must somehow fit into the world of stock options. If we do not act in this symmetric way, then we are merely presupposing exactly what is at issue. Namely, what aspect of 21st century intellectual life is going to settle our ontology? Many kinds of naturalism today, as Barbara indicates, exhibit a lack of symmetry along these lines. Hence, even if people say they are not reductionists, really reductionism comes back through the back door. OK. So now what I want to do to explore this idea is to take this last sentence in Larry Sklar's presidential address very seriously about apples and stock options and talk about it in uh, a little bit of depth. Let me, let me change the figure a little bit. Instead of talking about stock options, but I will stick with an economic example, I'm going to talk about the rate of inflation. And I know there's at least one economist in the crowd, so if what I say is false, that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about, for example, we outnumber them. Yes, I want to talk about the rate of inflation in Sweden, just to pick something um, off the top of my head. Last quarter, that was 1.4 percent inflation. A little higher than I thought. Now, if we're enamored of what Barbara calls metaphysical naturalism, then we probably believe that we must admit only physical items into our ontology. Then, of course, you wonder: Does that mean the Swedish inflation rate? must somehow be physical for us to admit that it exists. Let me explore that by making four connected points, hopefully. First of all, of course I'm going to say nonsense. The Swedish inflation rate needed physical. Why not? First, if you were to bet against the Bank of Sweden, perhaps because of some uncharacteristically bad advice from the great currency speculator Hubert Soros, then you can lose your shirt. And I suggest to you that if something can make you lose your shirt, it's perfectly real. That's as good a criterion of reality as what Barclay said, essay as per Kippy, to be is to be perceived, or what Quine said, namely to be real is to be the value of a variable in a quantified statement. Second, and a bit more seriously, it should be no impediment at all to admitting the Swedish inflation rate into our ontology, but we cannot specify what it is in physical terms. Again, I'll stick with the history of modern physical science for my uh, justification of this point. Even if we stick to examples like, for example, for instance, Newton's theory of gravity, we find that there was no agreement at all about what physically was going on. So, for example, Newton said, as you may know, that the sun impresses a force of gravity on the Earth across millions of miles of possibly empty space. For Newton, the key was the ability to measure the force through the law of universal gravitation. He was then able to say that it was proportional to the masses of bodies. He did not, however, have any idea physically what gravity was. Was it dependent on a medium? Was there an ether? Was there an exchange of particles instantaneously? No one knew. And yet, the history of science indicates, very obviously, that people accepted Newton's treatment of gravity, became the centerpiece of modern mathematical physics in many ways, and yet there was no agreement whatsoever about what gravity is, physically speaking. Hence, naturalists should look to the history of philosophy and the history of science if they believe that we have to assert everything we adopt within our ontology must be physical, in some sense we can understand. Even in the history of physics, we weren't able to do. But gravity was no, no worse off for all of that. 
Third, now we get to our apple. Naturalism that's enamored of reductionism can sometimes get off the ground by taking an example of the following kind. Consider Newton's famous apple falling from a tree. We know that this apple consists of apple parts, and we know that the apple parts consist of littler parts, and eventually we get to molecules and cells, as studied by, say, microbiology or biochemistry. We also know that those molecules and cells eventually, if you get down to the smallest level, consist of things like electrons, as studied by physics. Many philosophers in the 20th century thought, aha, that means really, they love to use that word, really this is just a bunch of things like electrons. Some would even say, it must not really be an apple, it's just a bunch of electrons. Hence, our poor little apple has been reduced away. I am skeptical of this kind of inference, as you can imagine. But I want, actually, for the sake of argument, to grant it. Because I'm still focused on the Swedish inflation rate. <laughs> the key difference between our little apple and the Swedish inflation rate is this. Even if biology and chemistry and so on do not fully reduce to physics, Nonetheless, there are important linkages between these scientific disciplines. And indeed, chemists themselves study things like electrons. These linkages between the sciences and the overlap in their domains jointly help to render reductionism, in this case, seemingly sensible. Seemingly is important. And this feature emerges from the sciences themselves, I believe, not from some meta-level meta philosophical preoccupation or ideology. But no such thing can be said about the Swedish inflation rate. For economic theory and politics and social analysis bear no relation at all to physics, chemistry, and the like. It is only a philosophical preoccupation or ideology that demands some kind of reduction that can make us believe that economic events in Sweden must somehow fit into the world presented by our physical theories. They don't. Fourth point. Intriguingly, with the Swedish inflation rate, we can do something that Newton and company were never able to do with gravity, namely to give it a causal explanation. Some contemporary naturalists, this came up this morning, I think. I can't remember who put it, pointed it out. Some contemporary naturalists would insist that what we commit ourselves to when we accept contemporary scientific knowledge is the idea that everything that exists must have a causal explanation. Oh yes, it was in a quote from E.O. Wilson. Uh, from Sillians, I believe. Some even take that as a criterion of reality. But notice, although Newton never gave a causal explanation of gravity, which was connected to the idea that no one knew what gravity was physically, the Swedish inflation rate is exactly the kind of thing that economists and politicians and ordinary people do give a causal explanation of. So the mere fact that our causal explanations of huge swaths of nature within physics make no mention of inflation or currencies or any such thing, does not establish any intellectual respectable asymmetry that could serve as a guide to settling our ontology. For in other cases, the causal explanations are on the other side, and it is the physicists who lack them. Certainly that was true for three centuries. In sum, with our Swedish, in Swedish inflation rate, we have an item with four characteristics. First, it is causally efficacious, because I remember I lost my shirt by betting against the Bank of Sweden. Second, it is not intelligible in physical terms, but no worse off for that, just like gravity. Third, it is not reducible to any physical terms. And fourth, it is causally explicable. Hence I say to you, it is perfectly real. And yet it is obviously not featured in any natural scientific theory. Does this mean that the Swedish inflation rate is not part of nature? Is it supernatural? Is it merely in our minds? I hope you will agree that these are the wrong questions to ask. OK, with this under a belt, how am I on time? Is that OK? Mm. Five minutes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a question or a direction? I want to return to the conflict between science and religion, or the nexus of science and religion. One reason there is a conflict historically, of course, is that many features of nature that used to involve theological explanations, such as the diversity of complex life forms on Earth, now have perfectly ordinary scientific explanations. But more importantly, many self-proclaimed naturalists 
described in Barbara's Terry lectures, have another motivation for the conflict. They regard the sciences as providing us with a complete catalog of all that exists. And since, for example, God appears nowhere in the pages of that catalog, they conclude God must be an illusion, or in Richard Dawkins' phrase, a delusion. So now I ask you, why should anyone have ever thought that the natural sciences provide such a complete catalog in the first place? My answer is historical. If we return to what many regard as the dawn of modern science, the era of the so-called scientific Evolution, what we encounter is the formation and development of a fascinating discipline, not physics or chemistry, but what was then called natural philosophy. The founders of modern science, such as Descartes, Robert Boyle, and Isaac Newton, were actually self-styled natural philosophers. And there was no doubt at all in the minds of these figures that natural philosophy provided an exhaustive analysis, not merely of nature as we understand it now, but of everything that there is, including material things, like the planets and the moon and this apple, but also immaterial things like the soul and even God. Natural philosophy in its heyday, in the 17th century, was what we might call a Weltanschauung, a complete and overarching conception of all that exists. The soul, for example, was taken to be an essential and irreducible element of the system since it alone could explain phenomena involving human thought and action. The same is true of God, for only the creator of the universe was taken in the 17th century as the proper explanation for nature and its laws. I have some quotes here on the handout, incidentally, from Descartes and two from Newton. I could have chosen 600 others, uh, but there you are. 600 wouldn't fit on the handout. As Isaac Newton writes, however, I will quote this one, to, this is in the founding text of modern physics, the Principia. To treat of God from phenomena is certainly part of natural philosophy. Certainly, it was not open to question, according to Newton. So, Newton and company presupposed that nature encompassed not only the material world of plants and planets, but also the immaterial one of, soul, of the soul and its creator. These jointly comprise the domain of natural philosophy. Now I come to my conclusion. There are obviously significant continuities between the mathematical methods and experimental techniques employed by Newton and company and by contemporary scientists. But the early modern conception of nature differs fundamentally from our own. The mistake of many contemporary naturalists is to ignore the profound alterations and transformations in the concept of nature over the past three centuries even while they surreptitiously or unconsciously adopt the notion of a complete Weltanschauung from our early modern predecessors. Obviously, the knowledge articulated by contemporary natural science vastly outstrips what the early moderns had discovered about the world. But does contemporary natural science provide us with a complete Weltanschauung that can guide our quest for establishing a single ontology once and for all? It doesn't. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our second speaker is Casper uh, Jensen, who's an associate professor in the Technologies and Practice Group at the IT University in Copenhagen. Casper um, told me last night that. Uh, this university is a small one, which has been in existence for only 10 years, and that its stated mission is to save the global economies to develop software engineering. So they need him badly at this university, since he is an anthropologist of, 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 technolo of technological practices and stands back as a, a sort of a playful and acute and astute observer of what goes on uh, around these activities. Um, he is the co-editor of a Danish introduction to science and technology studies. Uh, he's the co-editor of a special issue of science as culture. Um, he has uh, published in many uh, journals in his field, configurations, qualitative research, science, technology and human values, social studies of science and sociology of health and illness. 
Um, but his um, most interesting work came out in 2010, his book Ontologies for Developing Things, or you could say Ontologies for Developing Things, Making Healthcare Futures Through Technology. Um, he is uh, uh, interested in the ways that technologies, that the technologies with which we interact uh, change and indeed uh, determine who we are. And last night after I had talked to him, I went back and watched some TV and there was an ad on for Jeep. And at the end of the ad, Jeep has comes forth with its new advertising slogan, which is, the things we make, make us. And I thought, oh, right. <laughs> so there you are. Um, and Casper, uh, lost my page again, is going to speak to us, contingencies of science and culture. Some inspirations from Barbara Hansen. Thank you very much. Uh, I realize now that Ernie G, that's the red science and technology studies. <laughs> As the introduction here makes clear, we are in a quite different uh, setting at Newton and Apples. I'll talk a little bit. So, dear organizers, dear colleagues, and first and foremost, dear Barbara, it's a great honor to be here today, and I hope and do the patient justice. Barbara and I met approximately eight, nine years ago. Yes, uh, the connection was unlikely. I was a PhD student from a department of information and media studies at the University of Oxford in Denmark, who had drifted into science and technology studies, STS for short. Sure. My area of inquiry back then related to some new hospital technologies called electronic patient records. I did microsociological studies of their development when I first contacted Barbara, I'm convinced she must have been complex. <laughs> and we nevertheless turned out to have, or perhaps rather developed, shared interest that testifies to the strength of one of Barbara's central propositions that both humanities and sciences operate contingently through chance encounters, institutional affiliations, and theoretical dispositions rather than according to rationality and logic. It's clear that there are large differences between my ethnographic studies and medical technologies and Barbara's work which is engaged with very wide-ranging topics, as we've already heard, from poetic closure, contingencies of value in literature and philosophy, the dynamics of belief and resistance, scientific controversies, and the interrelations between science and religion. Despite these differences, however, there are also um, similarities that affect our trajectories. From her position within the humanities, Barbara has provided elegant analysis of what science is, what it does, and how it operates. Working with science and technology studies speak to similar issues. And while Barbara has argued for the contingent and often surprising intertwinement between humanistic research and natural science, or the interdisciplinary traffic between the domains of science and culture, my empirical work has suggested similar lessons. But of course, this suggestion of a symmetrical sharing of interest is also imprecise. Indeed, it's not coincidental that I'm speaking here today in honor of Barbara rather than vice versa. For one central reason why I gradually became capable, capable at least to an extent of making sense of the relations between culture, science, and technology has been precisely because of Barbara's work. What I should like to do today, therefore, is to outline a few of her central contributions, not only to my work, but to the community of STS studies more generally. I first came across Barbara's work in the form of references and quotations in Andrew Pickering's book, Angle of Practice. Pickering was trained as a physicist, but he had turned to sociological studies of physics. His early studies were decidedly social constructivist, but in the early 90s, he'd become increasingly inspired by Bruno Latour's mode of non-humanist analysis. Rather than assuming that social groups were relatively stable in terms, for example, of their ideologies, these analyses stressed the ongoing transformation of social interests, both in response to other groups and to the material environment, including new technologies. In these analyses, the relations between society and science were rendered increasingly dynamic. Among references to Schilder, Deleuze, and Bruno Latour, I encountered Barbara Bernstein Smith. Her work was uh, in hope to argue that scientific aims were certainly socially shaped, as suggested by social constructivism. The qualities of the social could never be taken for granted, and figure and quote it from contingencies of values, so do I. What we speak of as a subject's needs, interests, and purposes are not only always changing, but they're also not altogether independent of or prior to the entities that satisfy our implement. That is, 
entities also produce the needs and interests they satisfy and evoke the purposes they implement. Moreover, because our purposes are continuously transformed and redirected by the objects we produce in the very process of implementing them, and because of the very complex interrelations among human needs, technological production, and cultural practices, there is a continuous process of mutual modification between our desires and our universe. Needs, interests, and purposes thus have to be understood as continuously modifiable dispositions rather than, for example, static cognitive structures. In contingencies of value, this argument is developed and deployed to great effect. It suggested, among many other things, glossing here, that there's no such thing as a great work of art free from its interpretive context. Value is an altogether relational and dynamic concept, and valuation processes are operational, influencing the ways artworks come to look and how they're received. Pickering adapted this argument and showed it to hold not only in relation to aesthetic judgment, but for processes of scientific judgment as well. The proposition that scientific development was guided by malleable needs, interests, and purposes put this mode of analysis on collision course with classical epistemology, a collision that would subsequently be analyzed by Barbara herself. While science and technology studies scholars have come to appreciate Barbara's work on processes of valuation, she had herself become increasingly interested in science, knowledge, and not least the controversies that scientific knowledge and characterizations of give rise to, did give rise to. When the science wars, which we've already heard referenced earlier today, brought the cause of consternation for many philosophers and scientists was that they saw analysis that rendered notions such as truth, rationality, reality, contingent as dangerously relativistic, not blatantly absurd. These discussions were in some ways analogous to the earlier cultural wars. As we know, these previous discussions or debates related, among other things, to the definition of culture, the question of how, where, and why it should be taught. In a certain sense, the stakes of the science wars were higher since they involved bringing the analytics of contingency and variability to bear on scientific rationality itself. In these latter debates, science and technology studies scholars such as social constructivist David Bloor and X network theorist Omar Latour took over the unenviable position of scapegoats previously held by people such as Jacques Data, Michel Foucault, and so forth. Barbara, of course, was a participant in both debates. I've heard her refer to herself as a veteran of controversy. <laughs> in both cases also, we might characterize her as a participant analyst. In the culture wars, the emphasis was decidedly on participation. This was invariably so since the literature department of Duke was an institutional center of controversy. Accordingly, Barbara assumed the role of an outspoken critic, addressing what she saw as regressive cultural political moves. One is reminded, for example, of the open gambit in her contribution to the politics of liberal education, which focused on Eric Hirsch, National Cultural Literacy Project. Not meaning to mince words, Barbara argued that this project was meaningless as stated, in any case undesirable, pedagogically unattainable with the proposed methods, and even if attainable, actually detrimental to the stated objective of the project. And this was on page two. <laughs> <laughs> she, she continued to characterize her definition of culture as shimmery in its ambiguity and arguing that his recommendations were patently absurd. At the end of the piece, she rightly noted that all of these problems would not, of course, prevent, necessarily prevent the first proposal from becoming national policy, establishing itself as the cultural equivalent of the Star Wars program. <laughs> now, in relation to science wars, Barbara was positioned somewhat differently in institutional as well as disciplinary and intellectual terms. The institutional and disciplinary difference related to the fact that science rather than culture was the topic of controversy, and since Barbara's work had not previously dealt directly with natural sciences and their interpretation, it was also not the immediate target of science warriors. This provided for a different intellectual perspective as well, one in which the participant role was initially more tangential. This is possibly why Barbara was able to view the science wars based as a kind of naturalistic experiment that could be used to expand upon and sharpen her previous analysis on contingencies and battles of value. Now with a focus on key scientific values, including truth and rationality, now studied as intellectual and institutional controversies unfolding in real time. We might call these second order science and technology studies, since they dealt with the meta controversies generated by frictions between different principles, theories, concepts, and methods used by a number of STS researchers and their philosopher, scientist critics. These results were published in Belief and Resistance, Dynamics of Contemporary Intellectual Controversy, 
At the most general level, this work showed how concepts and ideas develop as a result of ongoing theoretical and methodological debates and confrontations between different intellectual domains and practices. Particularly, confrontations offer particularly good opportunities for learning about such development, not only about what we call the indigenous states of these debates, but also about their general dynamics. And while continuous cognitive transformation is central to these dynamics, continuous resistance to such transformation is equally important. Thus, the, no the, centrality, of thus the centrality of the notion of cognitive self-stabilization, defined as tendency to often artful and rhetorical as well as cognitively effective circularity. What is noteworthy in the picture thus painted is a double symmetry. First symmetry is that both transformation and self-stabilization play important roles in the dynamics of intellectual life that co implicated and often simultaneously operational. The second symmetry is that this is the case on both or all sides of these controversies. The contrast to humanistic anti-science arguments is thus stark. Contrary to such critical discourses, Barbara's analysis does not unfavorably compare the naivety or shallowness of scientists' discourses and their self-understandings with the profundity of humanistic or social analysis. For better and worse, all are in the same game. Accordingly, also, all local and global results of intellectual controversies are generated in a field in which transformation and circular self-affirmation operate reciprocally across the board, but of course to different effect. Now, if one low-key pragmatic way of measuring the qualities of it is to consider its reception among the key communities to whose concerns it speaks, uh, it's noteworthy that belief and resistance was largely agreed with respect. I'm inclined to think this relates precisely to the symmetric position just outlined. Thus, STS scholars such as Andrew Pickering, David Bowen, Bro, and Bruno Latour, while bickering internally, were forced to praise belief and resistance. It was a resounding success, a major intervention. Bruno Latour wrote, offered a path to the open seas on which it is possible to travel much further than on the supposed solid ground of firm foundations. And while analytical philosophers of science were not exactly enthralled with the analysis, they were unable to dismiss it as entirely absurd or irrational. Philosopher Loretta Kort, for example, herself author of the Science Wars edition, A House Built on Sand, found appealing the relatively untendentious tone of the book. She even went so far as to appreciate its surface attractions, <laughs> which, which unsurprisingly she nevertheless saw as covering all deep deficiencies. We shall have occasion to consider the metaphors of surface and depth subsequently. Yet, as regards the content of the deep deficiencies, Cort is really is symptomatic. Her issue was with the supposed debilitating relativism of Barbara's analysis, which she claimed prevented it from providing adequate defenses against such horrors as creationism and criticism. Symmetry aside, then, even resistance clearly generated a rather unstable equilibrium between admirers and skeptics. Scholars such as Pickering and Latour were in unequivocal in their press for belief and resistance. To other readers, however, Barbara's meticulous symmetry was quite infuriating. Thus, feminist critics have read symmetry as a way of refraining from taking positions and attempt to recreate an untenable God's eye view. Epistemologists agree that the private a stable ground from which to speak, we are lost in relativism. Yet, it is perhaps testimony to the originality of Barbara's analysis that her symmetry, but she has referred to it, her even-handed intolerance is equally unsettling to left-wing critics and philosophical traditionalists. Her descriptions of intellectual life as an evolving ecology deprive standard dualisms, such as the critical versus the neutral objective, the progressive versus the conservative, of much of their explanatory and normative force. Thus, we are in a realm of symmetry and even-handedness. But since this realm, in fact, operates very different, different from the one that many humanists and scientists imagine us to inhabit, Barbara's work is also seen as extreme, as an extremely relativist, for example. Yet, worrisome as extremism sounds, it can also be seen as intellectually virtuous. In Barbara's own work, words conceptual extremity has nothing to do with uncontrolled excess or exhibitionist daring do but rather of an effort at clear and precise formulation and a rigorous working through of theoretical and practical implications. A single example from the chapter, The Unquiet Judge, makes this point. The Unquiet Judge is the name Smith gives to the constructivist relativist so often accused of self-contradiction, political naivety, quietism, and 
even worse things. According to critical humanism, the task of the scholar might entail speaking up against the powers that be, criticizing their misguided rationality, or troubling the objectivism that forms the authoritarian basis of our existing social practices. Yet Barbara's rigorous working through of theoretical and practical implications has consistently prevented her from engaging in this mode of analysis. For indeed, for the consistent constructivist, no social domain or practice ever operates according to an authoritarian objectivity that must be resisted. Quite differently, and epistemologically more radically, the argument is rather that objective judgment de facto never occurs and that it is in fact an empirical impossibility. Humanist critics, example of science and scientific objectivity, thus fight the wrong battle. They misidentify their target because they accept too readily the objectivist characterizations that certain scientists, politicians, or journalists ascribe to science. No less problematic, however, is calls to redefine and strengthen objectivity by adding to its traditional characteristic situational features, as in Sandra Harding's strong objectivity or Donna Haraway's situated knowledges. The problem in this case is twofold. On the one hand, the attribution to constructivism, the same deep normative deficits that philosophers such as Kort ascribe to relativism. On the other hand, the maintenance of constructivism as part of an unstable epistemology, which is patched up with bits of objectivism or oscillates between the two. On the one hand, thus balance objectivists and constructivists left and right on the same road, since non contested problems for actions are deprived all equally. On the other hand, extremity, since the path of contingency is followed consistently to its end point. This end point is presumably just when read a quote, locate the deep deficiencies of Barbara's approach. Yet, as her own work shows, there's not much to fear from letting go of objectivism, except perhaps loss of the authority of objectivist rhetoric itself. From a science and technology studies vantage point, it's particularly interesting that one of the central inspirations and exemplars for Barbara's constructivism in recent years has been the German uh, proto-STS, proto-relativist scholar Ludwig Fleck. Fleck wrote his tract in Comparative Epistemology, Genesis and Development of a Scientific Fact in 1935. This slim book was later discovered by Thomas Kuhn, and through his deployment, it indirectly influenced much of the later history and sociology of science. What makes Fleck so important? For one thing, he provided a sophisticated model of knowledge transmission, according to which communication never occurs without transformation. Indeed, communication always involves what he terms a stylized remodel of the way in which a group of practitioners, a thought collective, thinks. Different thought collectives interact, reciprocally shaping and sustaining activities, and for Fleck, as for Barbara, it is through such interactions that what we, that what we come to view as scientific facts emerge. Going further, Fleck proposes that truth itself can be characterized as an emergent and contingent phenomenon that arises from a universally interconnected system of facts in which is maintained balance through continuous interaction. Indeed, reality itself can thus be seen as a network in continuous fluctuation, a rather striking metaphor, as Barbara notes. Also a metaphor that strikes rather close to home in relation to contemporary science and technology studies where networks have indeed proliferated, noticeably in the form of Latourian actor networks. The resonances here are obvious, yet whereas actor networks designate fluctuating connections between human and non-human actors and their different, more or less durable, material interrelations and arrangements, Barbara's flag-inspired networks refer to the modulating, continuously changing communicative patterns that shape how divergent thought communities are capable of thinking and acting in relation to one another. And contrary to the Torian actor network stories, often stress the possibilities of overcoming differences in communication through materiality. Think of this title, How to Do Words with Things. Barbara continues to dwell on moments of destabilization and insurability, dynamics of intellectual controversy, for example, in which communication acts on communication in continuous loops, modifying or reinforcing the conceptual apparatuses of both thought collectives. Uh, but without the possibility of any final resolution. This is Barbara's deeply ecological, imminent, and also distinctly non-heroic view of the transformation of thought and its collectives. In an aside, the archaeology of knowledge, one of Barbara's favorite books, as I think, Hayden White reminds us, Foucault defines style as a certain constant manner of utterance, 
With this suggestion in mind, I should like to end by considering a few aspects of Barbara's style, its certain constant manner of utterance. First, this is a style of intellectual engagement recognizable by its careful execution. Many people have already pointed out here. There are never any shortcuts in Barbara's analysis. This ethics of specificity in writing follows from constructivist disposition, since the devil is always in detail to every new argument found that must be dealt with in its particularity. Her style, however, is also characterized by a certain tough mindedness. Barbara has never shied away from controversy, from making her views clearly understood. She is not always inclined to mince words and phrase. Reviewing the then new stylistics, Barbara wrote many years ago that when logic is slack, that's as little how rigorous method is, and in the new stylistics, the figure continues to be misplaced, all of it being invested in the cranking of the machine and not in its casements and connections. The appeal of Barbara's style, however, is not only its clear exposition, but also its dry sense of humor, as in the introduction to the same review, which began by commenting on the very term you, so I quote, does not, I think, require an eye made especially so by the light of too many setting suns to find in the word new a certain pathos. New clothes, new toys, get beneath the stiff folds and bright surfaces, images of the tattering and chipping to come. The newborn and the newly wed both figure forth in their very names the shadow of a temporality, but more poignant by their own ignorance of it. Having thus characterized the program's self ascribed aspiration to the new, she continued to show how it nevertheless continued to play the melody of an old song, replaying themes of dates and relying on assumptions, the fragility of which invariably reappeared under conceptual pressure, like the frequently reclued crack in an old teacup. Such biting characterization, I suggest, is another of Barbara's stylistic traits. The reason it often works to such entertaining, at least to my mind, effect, however, cannot be separated from the broader purpose of argumentation. It's a sense of humor always put in service of specific intellectual aims. Thus, it's necessary to identify Barbara's career long theorizing of how concepts and their users relate, function, develop, change as yet another constant in her manner of utterance. The variations are multiple here, since she has work, worked on an extraordinary breadth of topics, but the guiding intellectual disposition, constructivist and interactionist, has remained central. Subject itself to continuous modification, of course, in response to varying conditions with which the transformation of thought is always reciprocal to God. The final aspect of Barbara's style, which I should like to remark, in a sense, encompasses all previous ones. It's the vision that I take to inform her a sense of intellectual curiosity, an attentiveness to the music of chance uh, and the endless pattern variability of the world. It shows in Barbara's restless movement from psychological laboratories to Shakespeare, Nietzsche, and Derrida how poems and cognitive theory, evolutionary psychology, and religion flake Nietzsche and the tool. As we know, Michel Foucault wanted to free the history of thought from its subjection to transcendence, to cleanse it of all narcissism and free it from the circle of the most origin. Years later, Andrew Pickering concurred, arguing in a paper on time and the theory of the visible that critical researchers ought to let go of their preferences for the hidden and concealed. For these scholars, surface attractions continue to be preferable to the depths. In surfacing from, however, Barbara came up with uh, an even better vision statement. She said, One might very well come to the conclusion that only by surfacing from the deep can we discover the salutary pleasures of air and light acquire less subterranean or sunlit view of the continents there are to explore <coughs> and have the hope of dry land in the end of our journeys. This, I think, is the route she's consistently followed throughout her career, to such brilliant effect. It's certainly been an honor and a privilege to follow her and pass on the journey. Thanks. Our final speaker is uh, Kate Hales, who is a professor in the literature program here at Duke. Um, her uh, book titles are wonderful to read. Just if you, if you, she tells you what she's doing in her in the wonderful titles of her book. Her most recent work, just about to appear from the University of Chicago, is How We Think: Transforming Power and Digital Technologies. Preceding that, Electronic Literature, New Horizons for the Literary. Um, just before that, she edited a collection on electronic literature. And then 
My mother was a computer, digital subjects and literary text, also from the University of Chicago, 2005. A couple of other uh, essay collections. Um, and then in 2002, Writing Machines, which won the Suzanne Langer Award for Outstanding Scholarship in the Ecology of Symbolic Things. Um, uh, How We Became Posthuman, which I guess is her most famous book, Virtual Bodies in Cybernetics, Literature, and Informatics, again, University of Chicago, 1999. Uh, that book won the Rene Wellick Prize for Best Book in Literary Theory for 98-99. Uh, Kate Hales has won more awards and fellowships than you can shake a stick at, the conventional ones, uh, Guggenheim Fellowship, two NEA fellowships, a, Rock a Rockefeller Presidential Fellowship at Bellagio, and a fellowship at the National Management <coughs> Center, just to name a few. She also, when she was at UCLA, won not one, but not one, but two teaching awards. I think Duke is extremely lucky to have her here, an illustrious presence, and she will speak to us on reflections on natural reflections. Well, naturally, I've changed my title. Uh, my new title is Making Room for Causality or Not an unfinished conversation. In thinking about my talk today, I entertained the idea of composing a piece that would be congratulatory to our honoree, Barbara Hernstein Smith, speaking about her significance and importance to the field of science studies and to me personally. On second thought, however, it seemed to me the best way I could pay tribute to her would be to engage one of her texts with the same intensity, scrupulous attention to detail, and skeptical attitude as in my and her work throughout her career and made it invaluable to so many. Rather than adopt the posture of an antagonist, however, I want to position myself as a partner in the sense that I would like to challenge her to continue to play at the high level of intellectual engagement and integrity that's been the hallmark of her scholarship, and if such a thought is possible, even to exceed what she has done before. My tutor text is her most recent book, Natural Reflections, Human Cognition at the Nexus of Science and Religion. In her analysis of what she calls the new naturalism and the new natural theology, causality is a central issue. She takes issue with several writers in the new naturalist tradition for their impoverished view of causality as a simple, straightforward input-output phenomenon. Pascal Boyer, in his grandly titled <coughs> Religion Explained, for example, proposes, quote, our minds are not general explanatory machines. Rather, our minds consist of many different specialized explanatory engines, more properly called inference systems, each of which is adapted to particular kinds of events and automatically suggests explanations for these events. The cognitive model suggested here supposes these modules have developed through environmental adaptation throughout the history of Homo sapiens, arising, for example, from the need to avoid predators, choose mates, cope with the inevitability of death, and so forth. Having evolved, so the argument goes, they now operate more or less autonomously in consciousness, kicking into action whenever appropriate environmental stimuli are present. They are, Boyer continues, quote, computational programs triggered by specific kinds of situations. As Barbara points out, there are a number of problems with this model. The supposition of trans-historical mechanisms hardwired into the brain ignores, along with much else, the, quote, significance for humans of ongoing experiential learning, and I'm quoting from Barbara, as well as, quote, complex social, physical, and pragmatic dynamics involved in the transmission of skills and beliefs, in addition to, quote, 
presence among post-Paleolithic humans of such crucial cognitive resources as transgenerational material culture, schools, texts, and duplicated images, I'm quoting here. In other words, even if evolutionary adaptations exist, and as she points out, no one has shown their, ex their existence in the sense of in hardwired cognitive structures, they cannot operate simplistically as the sole determinants of behavior, but rather must be in continuous interplay with cultural, social, linguistic, educational, and individual factors. Taking as another example the human acquisition of language, explained by the new naturalist through hardwired mechanisms, Barbara observes with only a touch of irony, and this is the passage that Mark uh, quoted earlier today, an adequate explanation would seem to require at the least observation, uh, analysis of the types of experiments and developmental processes and cultural resources that might be involved in their attainment. And as she goes on to argue, the problem here is not only with the inadequate explanation, but that it shuts down other kinds of possibilities before they can even be explored. Her own preference, stated repeatedly, is what she, for what she calls a, quote, constructivist, pragmatist perspective. She elaborates, quote, I view cognitive processes in what is sometimes called an ecological or dynamic framework. I understand human cognition as the full range of processes and activities through which, as embodied creatures, we, like other organisms, interact more or less effectively with our continuously changing environments, thereby ourselves changing more or less continuously. We interact with our environments in ways that continuously modify our structures and how they operate, and these structural and functional modifications affect our subsequent interactions with our environment, so you get a kind of continuous cycle of change and modification." Unquote. Human cognition, therefore, is subject not only to adaptive mechanisms, but rather is engaged in continuous cycles of modification through social and environmental interactions. Although she doesn't specifically reference the large body of work that makes this view compelling, her argument here is buttressed by a wealth of empirical and theoretical studies. Indeed, it would not be an exaggeration to call it mainstream, for thinkers ranging from phenomenologists such as Merle Ponte, those arguing for embodied in action such as Morela, and cognitive philosophers such as Clark and Hutchins, maybe arguing for distributed cognition. Precisely because her argument is on such firm ground, I am, bold, I am emboldened to offer my first caveat. In arguing for complex causality, she suggests that persuasive explanation, quote, often takes the form of models of the emergence of complex phenomena from the dynamic interaction of multiple forces and contingent events operating at various levels of organization. Explanations of this kind are likely to be more adequate to the range, complexity, and heterogeneity of the phenomena involved than strictly linear input-output, inside-to-outside, depth-to-surface models sought and produced by evolutionary biology. It may be that the evolutionary biologist she cites indeed envision a, quote, strictly linear causality. But in bringing up emergence, she misses a crucial point. As a large body of work in complexity theory has demonstrated, complex phenomena ranging from cellular automata to multi-agent simulations to flocking and schooling behaviors in birds and fishes may be generated from a few simple underlying rules. Complexity emerges not because the rules are complex, but because multiple agents are interacting making the phenomenon unpredictable. This is a strong result, as Stephen Wolfram has shown, because it upsets the idea that surface complexity requires equally complex rules at a lower level of organization. Supposing for the sake of argument that evolutionary mod modules do exist, one can imagine a model whereby they generate surface complexity not through the interaction of multiple agents or modules, 
or, or through the interaction of multiple agents or modules rather than from the complexity of any individual module in itself. This is essentially the idea proposed by Mark Minsky in his Society of Mind, a model that advances the notion of modules without requiring or enforcing anything like a simple input-output model. With this caveat in mind, we may continue to sum up her argument. The new naturalists err, she maintains, because their model of causality is too simple too oriented toward evolutionary heritage at the expense of ongoing learning and change, and too aggressive in trying to make evolutionary explanations account for all human behavior, including religious beliefs and actions. And Mark uh, cited this morning one of the passages talking about the efficacy of ritual and religion and so forth. She summarizes these shortcomings under the term scientistic, which she characterizes as, quote, the conviction that the aims, methods, and products of the natural sciences should be taken as models for all knowledge. And this is, of course, the consilient idea. In delineating this particular kind of blindness, she argues that for the new naturalists, the strenuously rejected, quote, uh, rejection of alternatives could quote just as that could just as readily be seen as additional complementary and compatible explanations of a complex phenomenon that is the product of multiple interacting causes. In other words, they not, their model of causality is not only too simple, they strenuously reject as impossible other more complex models. In other words, she seeks to make room for other kinds of explanations a strategy that becomes increasingly resonant in the second half of the book dedicated to the new natural theology. Often written by theologians who are also scientists or scientists with theological bent, the new natural theology seeks to show that evolutionary explanations are compatible with theological arguments. With her usual astute analysis, Barbara observes that the new natural theology, quote, is largely a rhetorical enterprise, a matter of making a series of complex, somewhat paradoxical ideas credible through the skillful use of language. This often involved the construction of conceptual syntheses through an interweaving of idioms, particularly the blending of technical scientific terms with terms resonant with theological connotations. As an example, she incents the claim in John Thoth's significantly titled Deeper Than Darwin, The Prospect of Religion in the Age of Evolution, that evolution can be understood as a narrative or a story requiring, quote, this is a quote from Howe, contingency, invariance, and deep time. Barbara notes that this story is said to, quote, unfold, a term that, quote, carries strong theological echoes likely to suggest to attuned readers, quote, the manifestation in historical time of the divinely and the eternally ordained. Also appealing to the attuned is the notion of deep time, a term that insinuates evolutionary account accounts are encapsulated within an even deeper phenomenon, the time of the creator, who predates and anticipates evolutionary dynamics. Thus, the deep evolutionary adapted modules evoked by Boyer and other new naturalists are recontextualized as derivative phenomena that instead of upstaging modern humans by referring to a time scale measured in millions of years, are themselves upstaged by an even older an absolute entity. And who will be these attuned readers? Not, she suggests, the general public, but readers already familiar with religious idioms and terms. Envisioning the likely audience, she dryly notes that Hout's book and others of like mind appear, quote, to be tacitly understood by all concerned, quote, to consist of elaborate cognitive conceits, unquote, which are well, particularly are highly particular in destination offered by those who can construct them to those who can use them. A wonderfully uh, 
wonderfully ironic phrase. She observes that writers in the new natural theology do not seek to refute evolution as such. Often scientists themselves, they are distinguished in this regard from creationists and those arguing for intelligent design. Rather, they seek to make room for their theological views, and they take the new naturalist to task for postulating optic spaces too small to accommodate their theological explanations. With admirable even-handedness, Barbara notes that Houts and others position the new naturalist as their antagonist by arguments that are not always legitimate. Hout, in particular, she shows, overstates adaptationist arguments in order to make them, quote, look absurd and reductive by exaggerating the scope of their claims, unquote. Her moderate stance may be seen in one of her concluding paragraphs discussing how the selfish gene idea is handled in the new natural theology. Quote, Although our general structures and models of operation as biological creatures have been strongly shaped by selection pressures, not everything we do involves the furthering of our own reproductive fitness or the perpetuation of our genes. We are also, we may, we may also remind ourselves that as creatures who continue to develop throughout our lives, we are affected by particular experiences that shape our responses, purpose, judgments, and actions, and indeed our bodies top to toe, inside and out, no less significantly than our biological endowments. As this and many other passages make clear, Barbara shares the strategy she identifies in the new natural theology of wanting to make room for other factors besides the operation of evolutionary adaptive mechanisms, while not precisely denying that such mechanisms may exist. Reasonable as all this sounds, I finish natural reflections feeling not entirely satisfied, as if something were missing in the encounter of Barbara stages between the new naturalist and the new natural theology. The symmetry she finds in their shortcomings, the new naturalist having too simple a model of causality, the new natural theology having a model that was too diffuse, seemed to me a bit too neat leading me to suspect that perhaps neither of him is a truly worthy opponent for the subtlety of her views and the astuteness of her insights. So I want to propose that the conversation be continued, this time with an opponent who advances views fully as vibrant and complex as her own. Moreover, this new opponent is one who directly attacks the kind of mainstream view that Barbara espouses, and that I do too, incidentally, about multiple factors interacting to create complex causalities. So in this sense, too, he is an appropriate match. Moreover, to my knowledge, neither he nor Barbara are aware of each other's work. She is not mentioned in his book, although the kinds of views she holds are uh, abundantly discussed there, and he is not mentioned by her. So the encounter I want to stage between them might also be seen as an introduction, an invitation to shake hands and get to know each other before slugging it out. The worthy opponent I have in mind is Quentin Mayasu, the young French philosopher and student of Alain Bedeau, who stands at the forefront of the philosophical movement known as speculative realism. In After Finitude, he mounts a strong attack on what he calls correlationism, the main straight view that we can never know reality as it is in itself, only as it is for us. That is, we know reality only in so far as it correlates with our perceptual cognitive cultural environment. As is evident from many passages in her book, Barbara is a resolute correlationist, as the including discussion in, of new naturalism and new natural theology is clear. Quote, there is always room left for alternative ontologies in cognitive intellectual space, a realm that is neither cramped nor finite, but on the contrary appears both historically and for humans individually exceedingly and perhaps infinitely elastic. The view I am suggesting here is that all of these, not only the rival ontologies 
but also the roomy or confined onto the spaces they appear to occupy are products of our intellectual cognitive activities, unquote. For Mayasu, the problem with what Barbara calls the constructivist pragmatist position is that it walls off humans from what he calls the great outdoors, the universe as it is in itself, and not only as it is conceptualized by humans. From his viewpoint, the quote, exceedingly and perhaps infinitely elastic room that Barbara finds in the correlationist position is not nearly roomy enough. In this, Mayasu may be understood to be operating within the very broad-based millennial movement that seeks to decenter the human by engaging with non-human others. The movement includes a loose confederation of animal studies, post-humanities, robotics, think theory, and other perspectives that in one way or another seek to go beyond a strictly anthropomorphic viewpoint. Mayasu goes further than most in his evocation of a world that not only does not center on the human, but indeed precedes all biological life forms. <coughs> He begins his attack by asking about the status of what he calls ancestral statements, or the arc fossil. Suppose, for example, that a scientist mathematically calculates the decay rate of an isotope and is able to determine that the sample precedes the emergence of life on Earth. How would correlationism account for this statement? Since the time in question precedes life, including human life, is this only a statement about human, how humans view the isotope, or could it be a statement about the isotope as such? And how would the scientist view this result? Mayasu argues that, quote, one does not validate a measure just to demonstrate that this measure is valid for all scientists. One validates it in order to determine what is measured. Barbara would vigorously disagree, as the following passage indicates. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm playing both sides here of this uh, debate. The verifiability of any creatures, including any, any individual human's cognitive processes, can be seen not as the accuracy of its perceptions of a presumptive objective reality, what's really there, but as the relative effectiveness of that creature's ongoing interactions with its particular environment, given its particular structure and modes of operation. The real, under such a conception, would be understood as the more or less stable and more or less pragmatically workable cognitive construction produced by those, that creature through those more or less effective interactions. This does not mean, she goes on to point out, that scientific results have no validity. Rather, she is at pains to acknowledge that her point is not to dispute operational validity of scientific knowledge, only the inaccessibility of the world in itself as distinct from the world for us. It's no accident that Mayasu chooses a mathematical and quantitative example instead of a biological one where one might agree with Barbara that, quote, the world that each of us uh, experiences, what we can act on and be acted on by, is a particular, more or less highly individuated perceptual behavior in each. In the case of mathematics, it's more difficult to see how the isotope measure, although admittedly filtered through many such, many complex lenses such as human time measurements, apparatus, etc reveals nothing about the age of the Earth as such, not merely how humans view the age of the Earth. Since the data in question concerns a period before human life arose, to say that it is a human construction makes it, Mayasui argues, quote, devoid of sense and interest, indicating nothing beyond itself, unquote. He concludes that an ancestral statement such as this has a realist sense and only a realist sense, or it has no sense as such. So the reasoning here is if this only tells us how humans view the Earth, and it's a statement about before human life arose, that makes it nonsensical unless it has a realist sense. So that's the point of using these ancestral state statements. 
The rhetoric here is typical of his arguments. Repeatedly, he forces matters into either or choices, a strategy that allows him to move the argument forward in decisive, one might even say breathtaking, fashion. The contrast with Barbara here could not be sharper. And uh, I, along with Andrew and others, have noticed that her favorite word is dubious, a <laughs> word indicating doubt, but nevertheless leaving open the possibility that the argument she is contesting could be correct, although she does not think so. Her rhetorical strategy is consistent with her idea of ontic space as exceedingly and perhaps infinitely elastic, so elastic that she's reluctant to rule out any position as absolutely wrong, which nevertheless does not prevent her from making her views clear. Space does not permit me to summarize all the steps in Mayasu's argument here. Suffice it to say, he includes the first part of his treatise by concluding that, quote, in order to preserve the meaning of ancestral statements without progressing to dogmatism, we must uncover an absolute necessity that does not reinstate any form of absolutely necessary entity. And here we may suppose God is as good a name as any, this absolute necessary entity. So you can see that his arguments here, in fact, are touching on the issues Barbara uh, raises in natural reflection. He turns on its head the familiar theological claim that an absolute entity must exist, arguing on the contrary that, quote, it is absolutely necessary that every entity might not exist. This dizzying turn is followed by a logical train of consequences that lead to a vision of the world utterly unlike the world in which we live. From, quote, upholding the variant of the principle of sufficient reason, according to which there is a necessary reason why everything is the way it is rather than otherwise, he rejects that. He maintains instead, quote, the absolute truth of a principle of unreason. There is no reason for anything to be or remain the way it is. Everything must, without reason, be able not to be or be able to be other than it is. He concludes that, quote, contingency is necessary and hence eternal, and that, quote, contingency alone is necessary. The first and perhaps primary causality in this quixotic vision is causality itself. If the principle of unreason decrees that everything that exists might at any moment turn into something else, then no causal chains bind anything together. The notion is weirdly reminiscent of the claim Maturana and Veranate that events and environment do not cause anything to happen. Rather, they merely act as triggers for changes causally determined by the living organism structure. Mayasu does them one better by doing away with the trigger, thus plunging us into a world of absolute contingency. The surprising turn of this argument at this point, and one that can, keeps it from being nearly off the wall, and incidentally, I agree it's off the wall. The question is whether it's merely off the wall, if there's something else is his demonstration that the requirement that nothing is necessary in fact acts as a strong constraint on what is possible. Since the contingency of the entity is necessary, he argues on completely different grounds than pragmatic science that non-contradiction is a strong constraint on what is possible for natural phenomena. This is so because if a contradictory entity were allowed, then it could conceivably be a necessary entity, which is ruled out by the requirement that the absolute contingency of the entity is necessary. Therefore, the principle of, of unreason surprisingly leads to a principle of non-contradiction. In an evocative passage, Mayasu draws a picture of the absolutely contingent, non-anthropomorphic universe he envisions. Significantly, he phrases it as a release into the great outdoors that we can achieve if we abandon the correlationist position. Quote, if we look through the aperture which we have opened up onto the absolute, what we see there is a rather menacing power, something insensible and capable of destroying both things and worlds, 
of bringing forth monstrous absurdities, yet also of never doing anything, of realizing every dream, but also every nightmare, of engendering random and frenetic transformations, or conversely of producing a universe that remains motionless down to its inner recesses. We see an omnipotence equal to that of the Cartesian god, incapable of anything, even the inconceivable, but an omnipotence that has become autonomous without norms, blind, devoid of the other's divine perfections, a power with neither goodness nor wisdom, ill-disposed to reassure thought through the veracity of its distinct ideas. Among the myriad objections one might make to this vision, perhaps the simplest and most compelling is that it is utterly unlike the world we know. So unlike, in fact, that it's impossible to believe anthropomorphic lenses alone might have prevented humans from seeing this world as reality in itself, not simply reality for us. Before we dismiss Meosu's argument altogether, however, I'd like to make a closing observation. His vision has indeed made room. Indeed, it has blown the room Group's door off its hinges, <laughs> opening up a vast ontic space that is profoundly non-anthropomorphic in all kinds of ways and for all kinds of reasons. Clearly, there is something wrong here, as I am sure Barbara would want to point out. Nevertheless, I think his argument is worth grappling with precisely because it starts from premises utterly unlike common sense. In this sense, it is cleared the ground of a tremendous amount of cultural and theoretical baggage, and therein lies its virtue. Starting from severely limited conditions that he articulates as the absolute necessity of contingency, what further constraints might it be possible to derive? To put the matter another way, what further limits would we have to impose to arrive at a world we could recognize? I find this possibility interesting because it does, it does an end run around what we think we know and allows us to begin from an entirely different point. I'm reminded of the sentiment expressed by the scientist in Tom Stoppard's play Arcadia, what a marvelous time to be alive when everything you thought you knew is wrong. <laughs> and you can see what I'm doing here. May assume last the way the world we know presents us with this very stark vision of, that invites us, in a sense, to build up from there. Barbara is starting with the world we know, insisting on complex causality and all kinds of interacting factors. But uh, the problem with that approach is what it takes for granted. What it takes for granted that we might not even be aware of presuppositions we hold that make her arguments sound so sensible, sensible to me, among all the sensible to other people, that uh, in fact they be limiting what it is we do. The one passage in After Finitude with which I think Barbara might agree in tone, although not in effect, is Mayus's concluding call for reasons to, for readers to raise doubt not dubious ones, but fiercely logical ones, strong enough to contest the chain of consequences he draws. Quote, Far from seen in criticism of threat, he writes, the examination of the determinate conditions for absolute unreason should strive to multiply objections, the better to reinforce the binding texture of its argumentative practice. It is by exposing the weaknesses in our own arguments that we will uncover by way of a meticulous step-by-step -step examination of the inadequacies of our reasoning, the idea of a non-metaphysical and non-religious discourse on the absolute. For it is by progressively uncovering new problems and adequate responses to them that will give life and existence to a locus of contingency, which is to say, reason emancipated from the principle of reason, a speculative form of the rational that would no longer be metaphysical reason. Although Barbara would no doubt vigorously disagree that raising objections would serve to strengthen the case for speculative realism, the invitation to engage seriously and strenuously is obviously open to everyone. The conversation I have sought to initiate has begun.
That it is unfinished is surprise no one, least of those us, least of all those of us assembled here. I can think of no better tribute to her work than to suggest the new vistas of late her subtle and persuasive analysis. Her work continues in multiple senses, including that initiated by the book she has written and by those she may yet choose to write. <laughs> I was really surprised that the interlocutor that you brought up as who would be Barbara would be in contestation with, and it makes such perfect sense because Mayasu really does write from reading and making use of science. But um, this is my thought, and I wanted to see what your thought would be in, in response to it. I began to think as people were talking that Barbara to me seems to be the uh, Kantian at, at its best, which is better than Kant, and that is to not forget the critique of pure reason is that reason has limits, and to be able to show that with reason while recognizing reason's limits, which is uh, something Kant seemed to forget <coughs> as he wrote, and it seems to me that Mayasu is con Kantian of the worst sort, and that he forgets the limits of reason, which you sort of alluded to with trying to get at what limit his view, because he, he purports a pure reason that knows no limits, it seems to me. And his work bothered me in a way that's probably good because of his critique of correlationism, which is what I hold so dear. So in some ways it bothered me, but in a way that maybe you need to have your foundation rocked at times. But I wondered what you thought of that sort of critique of Mayasu and accolade to our Well, uh, there's something profoundly paradoxical about his method, as you're suggesting, I think. And that is through the scrupulous application of logic, which is sort of the most refined and mathematical form of reason, to arrive at the principle of unreason. So there is a strong paradox there. And I do think it's significant, as I said, that his models are always mathematical or logical in nature. They're not biological. And so there is a kind of forcing quality that you might see in a mathematical theorem about his discourse in general. And I think it's that which allows him to arrive at such a shockingly uh, uncommonsensical view of what the world might be. But nevertheless, I think there may be advantages in putting him into conversation with correlationists, Barbara among uh, others, because it is one of the few uh, contemporary pieces I found that does not accept correlationism. In fact, mounts a very strong attack on it for completely different reasons than uh, realist philosophers or realist scientists might, might do. So I think that this uh, encounter could, in fact, strengthen the correlationist argument, uh, as well as perhaps uh, allow people like Mayasu to develop this line I've never read an ASU, so I, I can't really um, comment. I just need to be honest on. uh, about, about that. I found it very intriguing, but one thing that struck me is this example of the isotope. Uh, so we measure the you know decay of some element or something, we say this item is, let's say, 4 billion years old or something that predates the existence of life on Earth. And I took you to be saying that in Mayasu's view, um, we have to choose now between either the opinion that what we have measured is the age of the Earth or the opinion that somehow what we're doing is figuring out what we take to be the age of the Earth, how people view the age of the Earth. My quick reaction to that is that's a false dichotomy. Uh, and it is a cutting edge dichotomy from, glad you mentioned Kant, the late 18th century. Uh, that's exactly what some Kantians would want you to think, but I really don't see why we now should 
accept this as our, our two options. I mean, I can go into that. I don't think. Want to speak to? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I also have a question. I guess a question about Mayasu, and um, that was pretty intense, Kate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really surprised. I mean, I realize it's hard to even ask you a question because you're not you're defending him only in order to put him in the table, you know, on the table to make things more interesting in a certain way, which I think is cool. However, you know, you are defending him to some extent. So I'm really surprised that you would be for a number of reasons. I mean. His vision of correlationism to me um, seems very abstract and cognitivist in a sense. And what I mean, what he's what he wants to do is be able to say to give a category that's big enough to include everybody and dismiss them, right? And likewise, his vision of mathematics is completely disembodied, right? I mean, as if mathematics was not, you know, mathematics is not like language, it's not like the ways that we know, it's something that's extra human, and so on. And I mean, this is, this seems to me to be, both of these things seem to me to be things that you yourself have, you know, developed a career, uh, you know, uh, contesting. So, I mean, I guess I would say that, um, I guess I have some reservations about throwing Mayasu in the mix here, because I think that it can, um, lead us too far away from what it is we're thinking of. And I, it's not that I don't think that what you're trying to do is interesting, but I think we can do it in other ways. And I point to two places. I mean, one is Whitehead, right? And, and obviously, Mayasu himself doesn't engage Whitehead, but his you know, compatriot, to whatever extent those guys are compatriots, Graham Harmon, you know, develops a reading of Heidegger that is, in a certain sense, offering an explanation of what Whitehead explains without the relationality all the way down theory. Right? But Whitehead is somebody who gives us a vision of causality that is very complex, that starts from the domain of these actual entities, which are not things we engage with empirically, and by lineages of causal efficacy, goes all the way up to human consciousness. And what I find interesting here in relation to correlationism is that he himself sees himself as a, as a critic of Kant, and as somebody who's overcoming this um, division between the phenomenal, what we can know, and the noumenal, and he's doing so in a way where he situates human knowledge and cognition, and the, you know, in the most narrow sense too, within larger networks of causality. So there's not a way to say that this is one thing and this is something else, right? That these causal networks are actually uh, the real in a certain sense, right? And another place I would point would be in decoherence interpretations of quantum mechanics, right? Where you have specifically a mechanism of selection of possible outcomes, right, constraints, but that comes from within, you know, what, what you're calling common sense, right, or within, um, within the action in a certain sense. So I guess, in my opinion, these are very interesting and potentially very fruitful models for raising similar questions about causality and about correlationism, although not in a way that takes correlationism to be something fixed and whatever the way Mayasu does, that don't involve us in, you know, the, I don't know, the, the, the weirdness, I don't know, the wackiness, the off-the-wallness, um, the, the, you know, the, the kind of detours that that kind of thing gives. So I guess I just, I, I appreciate what you're doing, I think it's interesting, but I wonder if, I have some reservations about the wisdom of kind of doing that, uh, I guess. Well, thank you, that's a, that's a really good comment. Um, and maybe I could make clearer my own fascination with this school of philosophical thought. Um, I appreciate Barbara's work in part because I share so many of her ideological commitments, uh, indeed a commitment to what she calls the constructivist, pragmatist position. And it does seem to me that uh, in the years since the scientist, science wars, that position has come to be more or less mainstream. Mainstream in philosophy, certainly mainstream in science studies. So in that respect, I think that Barbara's work is uh, speaking to the way many, many people think now. So the question is, now that that has been, that particular battle has been fought and won, where do we go from here? And one way that we go from here is the direction that you're suggesting, let's think about even yet more complex models of causality. But there's another approach, which is Mayasut's approach, to say 
but going back to Hume and saying, Hume raises the objection that there's no way to demonstrate causality. It remains an inference. You have event A followed by event B, and you make the inference that there's a causal connection between A and B. But what if that's not so? What if we take the opposite bet and say causality doesn't exist? Now, it almost seems impossible to envision a world in which causality doesn't exist. But what I like about it is that it's going back to first principles. And it's saying, here's a bifurcation in the history of philosophy and the history of thought. Virtually everyone has taken this branch. What if we look at the other branch? And it may be that the way forward is to develop more complex models of causality. But I think that this is a really interesting gambit that might be revealing to follow up. So I don't, I don't uh, deny that there's virtue in looking for more complex models of causality, but that still assumes the causality. What if, you know, what if we take the opposite uh, thread, if, if only to entertain it as a hypothetical what if? What might we learn from this what if? And that's sort of the reason I'm suggesting he would be a worthy opponent for Barbara to take on with her subtle and astute analyses. Uh, thanks, guys. Can I um, ask a question about symmetry? Um, if I recall correctly, I think you all used the word to describe Barbara's work. And I got a sense that you were using it in a slightly derogatory sense, um, that the work has been too symmetrical, perhaps. Um, I wonder if one or all of you have something to say about that. I mean, it's not my reading of Barbara's work that it is symmetrical. Um, I, I, I tend to think of symmetry as re reflective. Two sides that are the same, something a little bit about symmetry. Um, and, and I liked, uh, Casper, I think you said about uh, intolerant, uh, even handed intolerance. Um, and so there's something more kind of charismatic than symmetrical, it seems to be, about these arguments that, that are uh, able to hold both sides in mind. But do, do you have anything to say about that? Anything? Uh, uh. Yes, I can say something about that. Um, I'm not even 100% sure how Barbara herself uh, interprets symmetry, but it's uh, within science and technology studies, there's a lot of talk about symmetry, and it generally means one of two things. The first thing is a social constructivist principle, which means that you, in order to do social studies of science, you cannot assume uh, the veracity, truthfulness of whatever scientific claim is taken for granted right now. That therefore you cannot explain, or pseudo explain a scientific truth right now. <coughs> uh, why we believe it uh, in, in gravity, that's because our descriptions or explanations of gravity are true, whereas we believe in something else, and that was because of, uh, well, cognitive deficiencies or political bias or something else. That's an asymmetrical explanation whereby you explain the false, what we now view as the false in one way, what we now view as the true in another way, typically with reference to scientific method and so on. So that level of symmetry is one in which you say you've got to explain no matter what knowledge claim <coughs> with the same kinds of general uh, categories and methods. And I think that is a kind of uh, approach, uh, that way of thinking that Barbara sticks to pretty clearly the so-called generalized symmetry is introduced by uh, so X-network theorists, and that proposes a symmetry in terms of kinds of agents that may act in the world. So that's a different level. It's the idea that human and non-human agents may both compose our worlds, and it's not we're not solely in the in a universe of hum human humans aren't necessarily at the center of things. Then I'm not so sure where exactly Barbara would be. Uh, where she would locate herself, but it's, it's certainly uh, something that, that is very prevalent and that I make use of myself. But it is important to say in that regard that symmetry does not mean that everything is equal. I mean, that's, that's crucial in that regard. It's not to say that it, it, it's not a, a kind of judgment, quality of 
knowledge claims, it's a kind of methodological precaution to ensure that you don't take uh, the victors of history's explanations for granted, thereby you, you're enabled to delve into, for example, the genealogies of why we why facts look the way we currently think, while you can also uh, deal with the fact that in 15 or 100 years' time, we may think differently what we think now will be forced. So that's basically that. The, the, the crucial thing in terms of the, I think, the quietism charges that symmetry does not mean that everything is equal. It's the methodological aspect of enabling us to view it as equal in order to describe and analyze different. That's how I understand, certainly, to be what, uh, uh, to, to be Barbara's view as well. prolongation, so I don't know if it's suitable right now, but I was a little bit just sitting there thinking about Miyazu, is that how we say his name? And I had a couple of reflections. The first thing that affects me a little bit was what are all the battles that have been won so that we actually need to propagate new, very complicated battles for ourselves. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, not, it's not my impression. From my part of the world, there's absolutely no lack of battles that have not been won. And in fact, I think we're in the process of losing quite a few. So, so this is simply a, cur a curiosity. It's, no, it's also not my impression from reading the leading uh, STS journals that everybody uh, agreed very much with what Barbara is arguing. To the contrary, I think there's a kind of, uh, uh, from my point of view, regressive uh, moves of various sorts where constructivism is increasingly challenged and conceptual work at large is challenged with reference to things such as utility orientation and get, get back to reality. So for example, in my case, don't study all these technologies, you know, help build them better, don't, uh, don't trouble anything, uh, uh, engage constructively, don't do constructivism. <laughs> so, so I think that there's far more work and also more, from my point of view, more interesting battles perhaps than engaging with French physicians. <laughs> I, I also strongly, it's so much fun. <laughs> strongly dislike the notion of uh, correlationism. I would, under no circumstances, ex accept to the application of that term to myself, because it seems to, in fact, uh, assume some other possible world in which, I mean, the phrase was something like, uh, oh, I, I, I missed. The, the definition, it's but something, some reality external of some kind of correlates, correlates in some way or another with our perceptual behavioral dispositions or niches or activities. But I think the central point is they are, that is the world. There's therefore no correlation between that and an outside. So that in a certain sense, the problem is, I mean, I, I wouldn't want for any constructivist or interactionist to accept the term correlation as to what they're doing because it's giving, as far as I can see, most of the playing field right away back to the, in the hands of realists, speculative or otherwise, such as Esmeria Su. I think possibly some of the more interesting things in, in science and technology studies is the suggestion that there's no kind of, there's no, it's not a zero sum game between constructed and real. So you attempt to not be. Kantian, uh, you, you attempt to be in a sense pre-Kantian, but not in the sense that you aim to go back to the idea that you can access the world in an unmediated sense, one, one way or another, through the idea that you can access the world by mediating it yet more. That would certainly be the actor network kind of kind of argument, and I think it leads to an altogether different setup than the one that comes with the uh, well, with the correlation thesis. So just a couple of thoughts there. Well, thanks. I'd like to just um, respond to that if I might. Um, 
I think that you're absolutely right to quarrel with the word correlationist because it does imply, as you say, that there is a possibility of seeing the world in itself as opposed to the world for us. So uh, perhaps by accepting the term, one has already accepted that dichotomy which you're refusing. But uh, let me underscore again what I see as the potential of Mayasu's approach. And that is that um, if we situate ourselves within, let us call it, the constructivist position, um, you can go further, as Mark has suggested, by finding more complex models of causality and so forth. But what about the other possibility of stripping things away, in which case you arrive at this very uh, alien world that Mayasu describes, but not stopping there? Then trying to imagine what you need to add to that world to make it increasingly like the world we know. So it's some, someone like Shannon was doing with language. You take a random string of letters, it looks utterly unlike language, and then you add a series of successive constraints, and it gets more and more like English. What do you learn from that process? What you learn from that process are what are the constraints that are necessary to generate uh, English. So you learn something about the structure of language and ways in which it differs from random syllable generations. So the most impressive part of Mayasu's work for me is the fact that he begins that process by asking, if you adopt the principle of unreason, what follows? And it turns out a very strong constraint follows, which is the exclusion of non-contradictory entities. So. My interest is then to ask the further question, what other constraints might you add to this model to make it look more and more like the world we know? And what could you learn from that process as opposed to operating within a constructivist universe? So it's not that I'm just suggesting here's a new battle that we can fight. I think you're absolutely right on that. Rather, it's a new philosophical, I won't say new, I'm make that claim. It's a strategy that's very different from constructivist strategy. And by following that strategy, we might possibly learn things from it we could not learn from a constructive strategy. I think on that note, time to go. Thank you so Thank you. much.